Okay, it's one o'clock, so I think we're going to start this panel. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. This is, uh, it, it, if you're not expecting to be at the Getting the Technology and Science Rights for Novels, you're probably wrong. So, um, yeah. all right, so uh, we've got four, yeah, four panelists and, uh, and, 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 one, and one in memoriam because uh, I actually did want to point that one out right away right up front. Matthew Mather, uh, I wrote this down so I can remember um, you know, the wording, but, uh, so Matthew Mather was born in Sheffield, UK on September 28, 1969. Lived most of his life in Montreal, Canada. He was gonna be a panelist. Uh, had a car accident. Uh, he and I talked a lot in private at first about technology, but in the last handful of years, we had a lot to say to each other about politics, especially over COVID. And given this crazy Canadian ways, we would often get deep into the weeds on these discussions for much longer than would seem sensible. Uh, we were both sort of stubborn mules about it all, uh, but the thing was, we could disagree vehemently without being disagreeable. It seems like nowadays it's become a pretty rare attribute. We had plans to crack open some beers and continue arguing about politics, but this time face to face here in Vegas. And almost certainly we'd both have been smiling as we claimed the other held chronically wrong-headed views. Uh, life is shorter than we think, even under normal circumstances, and sadly Matt has gone sooner than anyone had anticipated. Uh, it serves as a lesson to us all, live your life to the fullest. Always learn new things, gain new skills and use them. You never know what tomorrow brings, and given that, we're all here to hopefully learn from each other, and that leads us to the top of this panel, uh, getting the technology and science right for novels. Uh, we'll cover a bunch of things. This is more going to be a discussion amongst you know, fellow authors, and uh, uh, what I'd like to do is uh, we'll structure it in a way that we have a set of questions that we're going to go back and forth and have discussions about. Hopefully it, it might cover a lot of things that you're curious about, but if there's things that you have questions that we didn't cover, uh, I plan on reserving some time to uh, go ahead and have uh, you know questions from the audience as well. And we'll try to entertain them as well as best we can. Uh, let's start with a quick round of intros. Uh, Mark. So, what, what, so. Um, so my name is Mark Cameron. I am uh, from Alaska. I write, I'm traditionally published. I write for the Tom Clancy Estate. I write Jack Ryan novels. Um, Don Bentley writes the Jack Ryan Jr. novels. And I write the, the, the uh, ones that come out in the winter about Jack Ryan Sr. in the campus. I write another series about, um, I started in Westerns, and then I write another series about an OSI agent named Jericho Quinn and then an Alaska-based crime series about uh, a deputy U.S. Marshal, which is what I used to do, uh, based in Alaska. Okay, my name is Mark Stigler. Uh, I was a Cuba Award finalist. I was also an HP visiting scholar. Uh, and uh, my favorite part of my background that I like to talk about in places like this is the two years that I spent writing computer viruses for uh, for organizations who shall not be named, and so one year that I spent uh, writing millions and millions of uh, bad checks to have bank circles. Hi, I'm Vera Nazarian, and I'm writing everything, any genre you can imagine. I started out with fantasy, epic fantasy, then I kind of switched to Jane Austen uh, fan fiction, like Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, my was Pride and Platypus. Then I switched to hardcore science fiction, and right now I believe that's my core genre. Um, I started publishing back in the 80s as a, as a high school kid. It was, a, it was like a lucky break. I sold a story to a dog anthology, so I'm hybrid. In other words, I've done both self-publishing and I've done some traditional small press and other things. But my big success, or at least you know, a little blink, started with self-publishing, which happened in approximately 2009. And that's when I started to put things out on DVD and 
so on and so forth. And then right now my current best-selling or most successful series is The Atlantis Grill, which is such a cross-genre that I, I cannot even give you a sentence explanation. It's a dystopian space opera, hard science fiction, military science fiction, time travel, ancient aliens, you name it. <laughs> just before I get too crazy about it, let me just pass it on. <laughs> Hi, I, I'm Mike Rothman. Uh, my background, I, I spent a good number of years on the East Coast working for a three-letter organization and eventually moved to Silicon Valley where, um, yeah, I, I've uh, been working different aspects of technology for quite a long time. I write primarily uh, art science fiction, techno thrillers, and uh, yeah, I, I, I'm probably best known for some of my you know, deep dives into science and technology. Um, so that takes care of that. Uh, this will be interesting. So we're going to treat this, like I said, as a discussion. So, um, here, why don't we start with you. Um, why, why is it important to get the technology right in an hour? Well, if you don't get it right, you will, first of all, screw the reader over. And it's not fair. because. If you're going to get a reputation of somebody who makes really bad mistakes all throughout, why bother reading your books? So my first concern is not just to get the science right, but to get the logical consistency right. And in this series, when I was getting to the science part, uh, it is near future science fiction. And uh, in book two, we have most of book two takes place as a fleet of ships is going through the solar system. They're exiting, and it takes all the book to do it. So we're going through every single orbit of every planet, and I, I, I have to go through the orbits of mechanics, I have to talk about time, you know, how long it takes, and we have to kind of look and see what's happening in the current events right now as you're writing it. For example, at the time when the New Horizons probe was out there about to get to Pluto, I was in my story two weeks from getting my characters to Pluto. So, this was such a thrilling thing. I literally waited to see what the world was going to look like. And I had some science, um, kind of like NASA experts and friends who were helping me out with some gas. So when, when New Horizons got to Pluto and there was a heart on Pluto, I stuck that heart in the, in the you know, my characters were experiencing the, the Pluto and they, they could see the same thing that the real life scientists were seeing. And, I felt such a like a validation because this was real science in the real moment. And from there on, everything I you know, any kind of scientific things I touch upon, for example, um, I talk about, about space ball, uh, uh, what is it? Um, black holes, um, quantum entanglement. Um, these things I've consulted with real experts. Anything I do is then if it's a, if it's an error there, it's online. <laughs> but anything that I got right, I think it is so important to have somebody to ask before you just say, oh, this is how it is. No, you double check with people who know better. That, that's my thing. So uh, I started out publishing for Bain Books, and the Bain Books audience is really hard science fiction devotees. And so the reason why I have to get the science right is that if I don't, they're going to crucify me. And uh, uh, today in the age of Facebook, they get to crucify me right in my face on my uh, Facebook group. So uh, that's the reason why it's important for me. And so you have to ask yourself the question, what kind of audience do you have? Are they going to crucify you? That's exactly right, and I, you know, I always, I had probably, well, I can't match the books that talked earlier today, but I probably had 14, maybe 12, yeah, 14 books done before I wrote my first Clancy, and, and early on when I was writing the Jerichos, I, the Jericho Quinn novels, I had a plot where there was a, a suitcase nuke, so one of the small, you know, the Davy Crockett kind of thing, but a made up suitcase nuke. And I did. I talked about the firing, the mechanism, and the fail safes, and all that stuff. And I inadvertently, and I did a lot of research, but I inadvertently flipped the numbers for the half life on some kind of plutonium isotope. That I, that was so many books ago, I don't remember. But I, I flipped, I 
made it 38 instead of 83 or something like that. And a nuclear, you know, thousand years. And I, um, I got this really nice email from a nuclear physicist in Idaho, and he said, man, I really like your books, I like your story, they move fast, but I just want to point out that you got this half wrong. And I wrote it back and I was like, dude, I'm just so happy that nuclear physicists are reading my books. <laughs> move on to the Clancy's. I guarantee, I, I know that 9% of the Clancy readers are reading with a you know, TI-80 graphing calculator and a gazetteer and then checking everything that I write. And as you say, in the world of social media, they can come back on you. When, I, when you first start writing for the Jack Ryan universe, they make you an administrator on Facebook. I had a 10-year-old boy excoriate me because his Ubisoft game wasn't working right. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that actually brings up an interesting point because uh, what, what kind of experiences have you gotten? Like, like I, I'll very much write things, and, and I, I have a tendency to cover things that are deep in technology, but you can only go so deep in the book, and I'll, I'll always have an addendum where I talk about the science. That's my personal approach to things. Uh, but you ever get it right and then you know you, you get people actually coming and saying no oh, you're all wrong because I, I, I don't put my credentials out there you know for people so it's like you know they don't know you know just the right wrong. so uh so you you guys have you know when you when you were right and the audience or, or members of the audience think you're wrong i mean how can you do it I have one example that still churns me inside because you can't correct it. So I have some review, and back in the times when they had comments, you were allowed. Remember when they, when you could comment on people's reading? Well, um, in my book, there are four color psychological primaries. There's a difference between primary colors and psychological primaries, which are things like red, yellow, blue, and with red, blue, green, and yellow. Those are not real primary colors but they are called psychological primaries, and that's a, that's a separation. Well, in my book, I had a categorization system where certain people were divided like that, and I used the term psychological primaries. So I had reviewers going after me saying, well, no, you have uh, primary colors are, you know, cyan, magenta, you know, you know the, the, there's, and there's the, the, the um, two types of others. There's a print primaries, which is cyan, magenta, the other one. I used to be an old computer tech, I, I did I worked on printers for decades and we used to have you know, physical printer colors. And I had to literally have, um, in my books, I, I wasn't on, um, either on Facebook, I posted multiple explanations to people. See, this is, you have light mixing, RGB, it's the red, green, and blue, and you get this side. Then you have the physical paper primer, which is signed by Jenny O. Black. Then you have the psychological primers. This is all correct, but the printers will go back and forth, and they can get knocked over. Same. So I literally rewrote my book with an exclamation. I was so frustrated to explain in like social media areas about this because it wasn't getting through. People were just, so I said, I, I <coughs> took my key and I had to fix that the paperback and with another paragraph explaining this. And I put up the video and then I gave them the lesson primary powers. So that's it. So I, I haven't had any. Any of the kinds of problems that you were just described. But, but I did have a one uh, encounter. Uh, one of the really important things you all want to get is you want to get yourself some beta readers uh, who will read your books and tell you what is wrong. These can't be your best friends. But they have to be perfectly willing to tell you what's wrong. Uh, and I had one of my beta readers come back to me who. Uh, had extensive expertise in image boards. And in my book, I had, had somebody hack an image board. And, you know, I come in with this expertise in computer viruses, but she comes in with this expertise in image boards. And she's telling me I'm completely wrong. And I'm looking at it, and we, you know, when we actually had a dialogue to see whose who's technological understanding is, is, is more correct. And in the end, I, I left the story the way it was, but I had to take it very seriously. You know, I guess it depends on our personalities as writers. 
I don't read my reviews. I don't really care what I, I care what fans think, but there's so many the kind of I think I've banned in Russia and China. That's who I think is probably you know, when I used to read my reviews, I get fifty five star reviews and not believe them. You get one one star review and it'll gut me for two weeks. It's like it's like knowing your own IQ. It, it does no good. And so I think that we is if, if somebody if I know I'm right and you guys are the technological experts if I'm right if I'm wrong it's your fault because I called you to ask it but but I also because I write so commercially I can't for instance Tom Fitz is a good example he got really in the weeds on a lot of things I mean there was one in some of all peers where he follows the the proton, whatever, some some piece of a chapter where it was the detonation of the bomb. Exactly, a whole chapter with the detonation of the bomb. Modern readers will not put up with that. So, well, I'm talking about commercial. I'm talking about millions of readers. There are and there are diehard people that will. I have to write for the guy driving his tractor, company, and the, you know everybody. So, for well. No different attention spans, and, and I, I realize I'm talking to maybe a room full of scientists here, but I want to write to scientists and moms that are cooking dinner. Not that moms that are cooking dinner can't be scientists, or guys driving their combines, or cowboys like me on a, on a horse with an ear body. So I have told my fellow writers, what well, our job is to make the reader feel like he or she felt like when they read that traditional, that old time classic. So we want to put in technology, certainly. There needs to be the technology, but I always tell people, it's, you know, they always say, write what you know, right? I always tell people it's more important to not write what you don't know. In other words, if you were going to describe Pluto, and you described it a completely different way, and then the thing got there, <laughs> I get shy when I'm around smart people, um, which is why I'm always shy around my um, It got there and it was described a completely different way, and that's embarrassing, right? So we write sort of circumnavigating around the realities. And it's just, so when I write technology, I make sure that I talk to somebody smart, and I take copious notes, and hopefully I don't flip them. But when somebody says I'm wrong and I'm right, I'm a jujitsu guy, so I said, is that so? And move on. And, and, and that's actually a really good point. Because I think inevitably, you need to understand who your audience is when you're writing. Because, you know, regardless of how technical we want to get, um, and, and I'm, I side much more on the commercial side than I do, you know, even though I, I may have all the credentials and this and that, you know, I, I, I write commercial. So I'm very conscious of, you know, is mom and pop going to be able to understand the level of technology that I'm describing? And even though I may be talking about some really advanced stuff, but I need a way to describe things or have someone in the scene that doesn't necessarily understand and, and it gives you an excuse to at least, you know, not dumb it down, but at least, you know, to kind of, you know, it, you know, people say that if you truly understand something, you can explain it to the gas station attendant. Mm -hmm. And so that's the exercise, inevitably, as an author who writes things that are handy, highly technical, how do you explain it to the audience in, in a way that they'll understand? Now, some people may have very, like, like the main audience, I mean, I, I, you know, as well, and, and, and they tend to, uh, you know, get really into the bits and bytes and, you know, computer. Um, but that's not what the wider millions of readers care. They, they, they care about understanding it and, and feeling like they're smarter now than they were before they read it. Because right. I, I learned something. You may have learned like the tree tops of it, but it's, that's good enough for 98% of people. Right. And you don't need to be you know, a PhD in physics to be able to grasp how the bomb sort of works. Um, 
So, let's read you, uh, Mark Hamm. Uh, does the time and place of the novel affect the level of the technological accuracy as needed? Yeah, that's a good question. So, the um, the next Jack Ryan that comes out comes out December sixth, and that is a I'm going to beg my publisher to let me write a retro to go jump back in time to 1985, sort of wedged in that time between. Um, so in the in the this is one of those right things wrong things that. People will argue with me when I say the Patriot Games comes before for October. Well, it doesn't in the way it's published, but in the timeline, that's the way the books were not written, but that's the way it's set in the timeline. So I wanted to put something in between uh, Hunt for Red October and Red Rabbit and, and uh, some of our clear and written danger, I can't remember which one. Um, but basically right after Hunt for Red October. So I, I'm writing now about Jack Ryan, who's been the president for like 27 years or something like that. So that's hard to sort of bend our mind around it. But time has stopped. So I begged him to go back to 1985, which was absolutely wonderful because I could talk to retired stealth pilots who they would have been put in prison if they talked to me about what they did. Uh, retired CIA case officers that are friends of mine. We talk all the time, but they can talk on the record now about what was going on in 1985 with the technology. And technology was so cutting edge. I mean, I remember as a deputy marshal using pagers, not to get calls, when I mean, we did that, but using pagers to plan them in people's cars so that we could turn their car off if they were running from us, things like that. That's so, I couldn't even talk about that back then. Now I put it in any book I want. Yeah, we basically call it and interrupt the electrical system. So it's, it's fun to go back and, and write about things that were. Or, or write about a whole story where there's no cell phone towers or cell phones, or where the cell phones are big dinosaur bricks or, or, or Dynatech bricks. Um, so I, the timing, I think, the more technology we have. One of my good friends, uh, James Lawler, who's a, a rights book former CIA case officer, he's out, so I'm not breaking the confidences. But um, he he says that he calls the global war on terror. And all Stuff. He calls that the, the global war on tradecraft because it's a different way of doing things now. It's, the technology has made things so different. Cyber that, well, cyber warfare and all that, instead of, they're still human, human intelligence and all that, it's but it's, it's vital. But it's hard, to, and it's hard to explain that to people that are all about satellites and cyber and all that, that how much we need that boots on the ground. So yeah, timing, time and setting and all that makes a lot of difference. Okay, now I have to figure out the scene in which I am going to shut off an automobile with a, a painter. <laughs> <laughs> something a couple of years later if the book has been out two years and you're already a leader or something is different and even we're talking about social political stuff and technological stuff so and a lot of times it's intertwined and when you're going far future that's not such a big problem it's just like that near future and then if you go far back enough like pre-industrial revolution again you can go and do whatever you like you know not you know, within logical constraints but you, you have more freedom of not going and making as many errors as you would in the here and now, plus or minus five years. So don't write about the here and now if you're writing good, solid, you know, logically congruent or whatever, science fiction. Well, I, I would also guess, yeah, or so I, I guess I would describe it as, you know, like the, the here and now has a different, like you said, it has a different requirement on the author's level of accuracy versus, let's say, you know, so, so one, one of the things I do is I, I, I have 
projections 10 years from now, 15 years from now, right. and 20 years from now on a technological basis, where, where will we be in storing technology with this or that? And I can tell you right now that 25 years from now, it's, it's kind of fantasy land. Yeah, you, we, have an idea, we have an idea of who will get there. You know, I, I'd argue that people in the 1980s would not have guessed that I'd be holding the, you know, this in my hand and have access to the world's knowledge. Uh, it, it just, you know, the further out you go, the easier it is to get it wrong, which is okay if you're in the future. But when you're writing about the current, you, you, there, there are going to be people who know. There are going to be people who are going to call you out on it. <laughs> and um, and, and you, you have limitations on how quickly you can be on your accuracy. I just have one I did I, uh, in, in the place where this becomes most exciting is in a single story that spans uh, millennia. Uh, I have one story that I published about uh, the main character. The first scene takes place in 1980, and the last paragraph takes place in uh, takes place a billion years later when the heroine figures out the right question. And you start out with very simple, very grounded science. And of course, at some point, you know, the science becomes magical. And you have to, uh, you have to deal with that transition across those things. So don't try to do that very first story. This goes in with the idea of the black box when you start going beyond technology that can be really easily explained. You just put it in a black box without any explanation and just treat it as some kind of a higher level that will be dealt with later. So you're basically just skipping it. So I think the black box is a great fit for that type of far future. So you can never be an expert in all things, but in what you write, you stick to what you know, and if you don't, you describe your research process. Uh, uh, yeah. Couple of, couple of items on this one. Uh, uh, I, like uh, probably everybody, uh, when, when, you, when you need to find a detail, a more detail about a field that you're not entirely uh, expert in, uh, obviously you go to the web. Now I do have one particular recommendation for people about uh, a thing to look for on the web, uh, which is uh, one of the things I asked the web for is what are the most common ways in which this technology fails? And the reason you want to get that is because that, that allows you to uh, introduce humorous examples into your writing. Uh, so there's, so yeah, I, I have some level of expertise in uh, large scale data centers, but uh, I had, uh, my heroines were going to go in and they were going to sabotage this very large data center. And uh, my expertise was not in sabotage, So I go to the web and I say, well, you know, how do these things fail? And so there's this delightful chapter in which my heroines are running through all the buildings full of computers uh, and causing uh, all the different parts of the system to fail in specific ways that are the ways that data centers really fail. So that was, that was fun. Uh, the, the other thing is, again, uh, I saw uh, some new beta readers. Uh, I had a really delightful experience. Uh, I had a book in which uh, a major subplot revolved around next generation educational technology. And uh, I, I, you know, I do the research and I write it. And I put it out to my beta readers, and at that point, I learned that one of my beta readers, Jim Campbell, who was sitting there, one of my beta readers uh, spent his life as a research scientist doing advanced educational technology. And so he told me about all the things that I'd done wrong. And he told me great stories about things that, that were right that I hadn't mentioned. And so that section is much more. So, so, um, like I said, writing what you know or not writing what you don't know. I always, when I go on a research trip, or, or whether it's a trip 
into the web or whether it's a trip um, over the phone or a trip to somewhere, my goal that I find, whether it's about the tech or the people setting or whatever, I, I go in with a, a list of known unknowns. I go in with a list of things that I want to ask, questions that I want to ask the people. And then when I get there, the goal is when I find those unknown unknowns. I didn't, I didn't even know that I was going to ask these questions. When I, when I get there and I start talking to people and they start telling me, oh, this is my background, I had no idea. And so then you get the, the little things that I, I was fortunate enough to, to go on a, a, a program in the Pentagon called the Joint Civilian Orientation Conference where they take about 40 people a year and they basically wine and dine us and take us all over the country or the world and you ride on ships, fly on planes, talk to soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines and, and really get to sit down and talk to them and learn what they're all about. And one of the places that my JCOC group with, uh, went with. I'm going to talk about this more in my in my value research talk that I give at some point tomorrow. I think um, But one of the places I went was to Creech, and I was writing. I had written the, the year before. I'd written a Jack Ryan novel, and one of my Jerichos had Creech in it as well. But I'd written a, a Jack Ryan novel that went into very a lot of detail about what it takes to shoot it. Right. Right too. That's good. So one of them, that's good. That's good. I, I need I need a beta speaker. Um, <laughs> one of the, the books was about what it takes to shoot a missile from a remotely piloted vehicle. That's what Creech Air Force Base. Nobody lives there overnight. Creech is an Air Force Base where people go to work. They go in these little cubicles. There's a sign that says you're leaving the United States. You go into this trailer and. Now you're flying an aircraft that's over territory where we want to fly aircraft, Afghanistan, wherever. Um, and so I wrote this big, and I, I interviewed CIA case officers, or, or ground branch guys and, and air branch guys, interviewed uh, my son's friends who were uh, remotely piloted aircraft. They don't think for not to have called drones, because um, these are real pilots, and they want to be known as pilots. So, um, did a lot of research. The book came out, I think it's called Oath of Office, I can't remember, but the book came out. Then I went after the fact, I went to Creech. And they know our names, they know our backgrounds, and we're all lined up, and the, the captain, who's a, RP, a remote pilot, aircraft pilot, he goes, all right, how many of you know what, what Creech is, and you know, and okay, so we're gonna take you all into the other room, and you, you, you go that way, and they looked at me, and he held up the book, from last year, he goes, you. Oh, oh, crap. And he, he was very complimentary. When we got out of the, out of the group, he was very complimentary. He sat me down in the pilot seat. He became the targeting officer, or, yeah, targeting officer, NCO. And he said, so you got it right up to this point. <laughs> Nobody else will know, but I know. <laughs> One of the things you may want to start with before you dive into the web is to think what kind of questions are the right questions to ask before you, as you're working with your story. Sometimes you don't know where to even begin. So what I would do is, as I do a quick search on your paper, Google, usually ending up in Wikipedia, which is a, it could be great sometimes, it is sometimes it's questionable, but one thing to do is look at the popular, um, popular science books that are out there, for example, Titles written by Michio Kaku or Neil deGrasse Tyson, and just get a good general idea because it's all for general readership. So once you get that general idea, then you know what questions to ask, and that's when you can proceed to the the real higher level experts. Um, in my case, uh, with the Atlantis Grail series, I was very lucky to know several NASA scientists, and um, for example, one of them works on the, on programming the computer computer running on the, the space station, international space station. Another case was I simply reached out to a NASA scientist who I really admired a long time ago, uh, Dr. Michelle Fowler. And you can do that. You can literally go to NASA and just reach out to any favorite scientist. And she's one of the people who has been, she helped me out with a lot of my questions. And then 
they can refer you to someone else. So you actually can be referred to very narrow, niche down people who can answer your questions. Because maybe Michelle doesn't know the exact black hole. She's, she's a specialist on um, binary stars. But if you need something even better, but she knows everything compared to me. But she can refer you to somebody who's even more specialized. So it's like a trickle down. You start general, then you find out what questions to ask because you probably don't even know what to ask. And I didn't. I had no idea what to ask. And then I got better at it. So I could ask things that are, you know, only partially stupid, <laughs> as opposed to full on clueless. And then you get into the habit of just like knowing who to ask, because that's all it comes down to. And I was fortunate enough to be a tech support person for decades. So I could explain things very well. Once I, I didn't have to know it originally, but once somebody explained something to me, I could explain it to the readers. So when you explain it to your reader and make it entertaining, that's when they start nitpicking at you. They stop going after everything because they start to trust you because you've done your, your homework. You've gone there. You don't have to be good at this stuff for yourself. You don't have to be a NASA scientist. You don't have to be a rocket scientist, as they say. But if you can talk to one and then translate it into your own words and make it easy for anybody to read, anybody who has not even had a science class can understand black hole theory. A lot of times the black box was a term used, for example, when you have uh, faster than light travel, which is scientifically a <coughs> big question. Uh, uh, you will probably have a better answer. But it's supposed to be you cannot go faster than light. <coughs> now, cutting edge science has said that yes, actually. There's sometimes it could, and I don't know there are being facts, but the idea of a black box is that you can exp ex explain like how Star Trek works a little, you know, or you just said there's warp 10 and there you go. So the black box was an unexplained fact. This is how your spaceship runs. Don't question it. Just let it pass. So you raise my kids Suspended. So let me read the question. Uh, what was, where's the line between hand waving and bad science? So, so I, I think it, it, here's here's where it really comes key. Um, because that, you know, like this question is related to you know, I've read, you know, I, I read fairly widely in the thriller genre, and, and uh, you know, so I, I, I cringe anytime I read someone and, and, and a very well known author I, 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 who I've talked to many times before, and uh, he blames the copy editor. Um, uh, but yeah, like for instance, the Glock does not have a safety. But in his, in one of his books, you know, he 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 turned he he, he took took the safety off the Glock. And I'm like, oh, Lord. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. You're right. Um, so it, it becomes one of those things where the hand waving. Yeah, you know, if if you're trying to, you know, like, like the black box thing is all about. You, you, you're not going to explain the science. You're, you're, you're basically saying this is just how something works. It's a gimme. You know, it's kind of like a mulligan involved. You know, where uh, you know, you know, don't, don't look at the man behind the curtain. You know, the, the, this just works this way. But uh, you can only get away with that. You know, a couple of times in, a, in an entire novel. So at some point in time, you have to do the research. And you know, like, like for instance, my, my process is is you know to, to winnow it out from you know what I think and how I think it would work versus not like for instance in one of my books uh, I, I was in a, um, in a Caltech facility in uh, southern Washington uh, a place called LIGO and um, you know and, and this was before like the first gravity wave was actually detected um, and but I had this in my book and I had a lot of assertions about how this would work from a theory perspective, I understood the physics, et cetera. And, uh, and, and I, now, uh, I have some access to some people that, you know, maybe others don't, but uh, inevitably you have access, you know, like, like I, I was exchanging emails with Kip Thorne, who ended up winning the Nobel Prize for that, um, you know, for, you know, what they discovered in LIGO. Um, and you inevitably have to find experts that will be able to 
affirm your Hanwavian to not be, you know, total nonsense, but to actually be real or plausible. Because sometimes sometimes you're gonna write some stuff, especially if it's science fiction, and it's cutting edge. You're, you're hy hypothesizing that it may be a certain way. So you just want it to be within the realm of possibility. Don't know, maybe, maybe not. So. I have, I think, a really important observation about Hanwavian, which is uh, uh, is uh, the place at which Hanwavian becomes unacceptable is the point at which the reader can no longer tell the difference between what is possible and what is not possible. Uh, I think a science fiction author, a famous science fiction author, who's in the wrong number, uh, once observed that if anything is possible, then nothing matters. Okay. Uh, if you have a technology that is unbound in its potentiality and can magically cause anything to happen in the moment, then you, you no longer have a system with rules. You no longer have characters who have to play within the rule system. And if you're hand waving them, makes it possible for anything to happen at any time, you no longer have an interest in something. Right, and, 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 and to go with that point, you know, it, it becomes, if you have a fine line between if anything is possible, then everything is a day of six months. You know, you've got to, you know, make it so. And, and so, 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 so your challenge, I mean, inevitably the entertainment aspect of reading a novel is that your MC, your main character, has challenges. Not everything is going to work out right. Or the, the science may not, like the one you guys said, you know, may not work as expected. It's like, what happened? Uh, well, it, it was good for it. Yeah, it's like, I thought it was going to work, but it did. So, so, so those are some of the challenges. Um, yeah, we're, we're actually up, up uh, we have like three minutes left. So I, I wanted to open up it. If there's people in the audience who actually have questions that they want, if you can go to the mic, then, then the people who are listening in can uh, hear it. Uh, sorry, I, I might not be the only one in the room, but I don't know what this hand-wavium is. Uh, so, hand-wavium is kind of a colloquial way of describing. It, it, it's, 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 it works sort of like this, you know, and you're, you're hand-waving. So you're not, you're, 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 you're making stuff up. Yeah, in, in How much can you rely on your reader's own knowledge of things? So, like, Everybody kind of has an idea what cryosleep is, but it's not actually a thing that works. Can you just mention it and just expect your readers to understand it, or do you have to go into explaining it? Yeah, so, so I think there is a line, and, and, and everyone may have a, a varying opinion about how far you go. Um, so, so for facts, for, the, for things that are real and we know work, I, I always try to get two people who are supposed experts, and if they both tell me the same thing, I, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling okay about that. Uh, if they didn't disagree, then obviously more digging was needed. But for things that are speculative, I, I think inevitably it becomes a it's speculative. So let, let, let's go with the topic, you know, let, let's describe what, what it is. You know, if I'm going into some cryo sleep, it's choice by the author as to how far you explain. Because the more you explain, maybe you're slowing down the story as well. So uh, you know, some things you have you, you want to leave to, you know, just assuming the reader, you know, is, is aware. Yeah, you can, I'm sorry, you, you can actually use conversation like you would a beta reader and just tell a bit of your story to three or four or fourteen year old kids and watch their eyes. And if they're like, okay, yeah. Or if they're like, I'm looking for somewhere else to go. <coughs> You can kind of, and I think you know, a kid, but they have very, you know, their, their attention spans. But just whoever, just tell your story, and if you're getting into the weeds too much, they'll let you know with their eyes, or maybe if they're 14 on the tell us. But, um, yes, and in addition to that, you may want to start with your beta readers, just as a general level of readership. Then, once they start to ask you more questions than you would like, you try to see if maybe your actual genre needs more explanation or less. Maybe with hard science fiction, you need to make fewer assumptions. You can assume that 
if they know. And a, a hard science fiction reader would not be needing so much explanation as a soft science or some other, other level of general reader. So it just says whatever the specific level of technology and science is in your books and that genre, you can kind of assume it. And you already know what the readers know and what they know. Do not expect more explanation. Thank you. Yes. Just one more comment on cryosleep in particular. You can generally count on the audience to know what it is without explanation. If you have Sylvester Stallone in Demolition Man uh, <laughs> having experienced cryosleep, then you're on pretty safe ground. Okay, thank you. Uh, all right, so, uh, so, so we actually probably only have, we're, we're at time, so let, let us do one last question and we'll follow up. Thank you. This kind of builds on what uh, you were talking about previously. How deep would you recommend going with rapidly evolving technologies like blockchain, AI, cybersecurity, buzzwords, right, that have vast implications and there's so much going on in those industries right now? So, so personally, with, with uh, current technology, what I would do is current technology is not largely going to redefine itself. So, so if you stick to generalities about the, tech, the current technology, you're probably safe. If you start getting deep into very specific things, that may end up being not good, you know, or, or, or become proven inaccurate, then you start dating some of what you're doing. Great, thank you. All right. Um, all right.